I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my administrative law class, or it could also be for legislation and regulation. Here we're going to be talking about Skidmore versus Swift and Company, an old New Deal era U.S. Supreme Court case that has taken on renewed importance after the Supreme Court's 2024 term. So let's dive in. This case is about uh, judges and judicial deference to agency interpretations of law. But first, let's talk about the facts of this case to make sure that you understand what's going on. Uh, this is an older case about a large factory complex, and um, they had their own firefighters in case that these were slaughterhouses and um, butcher plants. And they uh, um, had firefighters on location that worked for the company in case they had a fire in the middle of the night or during working hours. So they would already be on scene and could respond immediately. And the firefighters said that the time that they spent in the building after their regular work shift or normal business hours should count as work time, which would entitle them to overtime pay under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Now, what was happening was the employer, uh, Swift and Company, it required that the firefighters to take turns working um, a night shift and staying overnight. They had basic lodging for them, uh, kind of like at a firehouse where they would have a bed and a kitchen and um, showers and so forth. And of course, most of the time, most days, there's no fire. So they're just there. They can sleep. They can they play cards or play dominoes or they didn't have TV to watch back then. But you get the idea. Now, as a side note, there's no administrative agency that actually adjudicates um, FLSA claim disputes like this in the first instance, um, other, unlike a lot of the other labor statutes like the National Labor Relations Act. Even so, there is a bureaucratic office within the Department of Labor called the Office of Wages and Hours, the Wages and Hours Administrator, who has investigatory powers and can bring injunctive actions to restrain violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act. And this administrator's office issues its views or kind of guidance about the law in interpretive guides and informal rulings. The trial court in this case, basically, so these guys understand they're stuck there for longer than an eight hour shift which means they want overtime pay for the, the nights that they're stuck at the plant, even if there's no fire, even when they're sleeping, and overtime pay is going to be time and a half. So this would make a lot of financial, a big financial difference for the employees and be a big um, hit on the employer financially. So the trial court initially sided, uh, sided with Swift, the defendant or employer, on the grounds that engaging in pleasurable occupations like hanging out, playing pool and dominoes with your colleagues or coworkers does not constitute work as a matter of law. Now, the administrator had disagreed with this. And at this point, I want you to notice the caption of this case. It's Skidmore versus Swift and Company, not an agency. So this was a private labor dispute between employees and an employer. And the administrator um, basically intervened in the case to try to get the court to follow their preferred policy about this. So they weren't bringing this as an enforcement action or adjudicating it themselves. And that makes it a little different from a lot of our other administrative law cases. The administrator here of the wages and hours administrator disagreed with the assessment of the court and called for a flexible approach, said that waiting time sometimes counts as working time and sometimes it doesn't. Um, here, the um, administrator submitted an amicus brief saying that the firefighters spend the time they spend basically um, eating uh, for their meals should not count as work time because if they were working a regular shift, they would be given a, um, a lunch break and you're not paid for your lunch break. Um, so if they're eating a dinner or breakfast, that should 
um, not count as uh, work time, but the time that they're truly just are on call and ready to respond the minute an alarm rings, a fire alarm rings, um, that should count. So one question for the court was whether waiting time could ever count as work time within the meaning of the um, Fair Labor Standards Act. And on the question of whether waiting time can ever count as working time under the FLSA, the court agreed with the administrator that it can. But they didn't do this out of deference to the agency, like saying, well, the agency says so, so let's just go with what they say. Rather, the court resolved the issue de novo, kind of like they claim to be doing in the Hearst case, which is another case we cover in my course. And then they remanded the case. On remand, the trial court was supposed to determine whether this specific waiting time should count as working time within the meaning of the Fair Labor Standards Act. And this would seem to be a mixed question of fact and law, kind of like the Hearst decision. Now, even so, the court does not instruct the trial court on remand that it should give the administrator's opinion substantial deference under the Hearst standard. So Hearst, the, a big issue in this case was, does Hearst apply? And they said, no, this isn't, uh, there was no agency adjudicator here. This feature of the case and the court's reasoning is the most important part of Skidmore to remember, like what factors they actually do want courts to consider. So the administrator's interpretations don't, in this particular case about what counts as work time and what counts as basically unpaid break time, uh, it doesn't have the force of law. So they're not binding. They didn't promulgate a regulation about this. They just weighed in about what their opinion is as the regulators. Um, so they're more like interpretive rules than legislative rules. And even though the court does not think Hearst deference is appropriate, it does not call for all other lower courts to do de novo review. Remember, the district court had done de novo review, and the U.S. Supreme Court says, uh, we don't want you to just start from scratch or and from a blank slate and, um, and come up with your own interpretation and completely ignore what the agency said. So it says that the agency's interpretations are, quote, entitled to respect. And this is a phrase that, again, came up in the 2024 decision, Loper uh, Bright versus Raimondo, that overruled the Chevron case and Chevron deference doctrine. Um, and they said this, especially considering the agency's expertise and experience, right? It's the, this agency, this administrator's whole job to decide difficult questions about wages and hours and how to apply what the statute required in terms of overtime pay. So they thought about this a lot and they knew what the practices were across the industry. So they have a lot of experience and expertise. And then they said, and this is a big quote that you should definitely get out of the case, the amount of weight given to the agency's views depend on several factors assuming that the, this is an area where the agency does have expertise and experience, including the, quote, thoroughness evident in the consideration, the validity of its reasoning, the consistency of the agency's interpretation with other pronouncements, and so forth. And so these are our Skidmore factors. And if there's only one thing you're going to get out of this case, it's this slide. The Skidmore factors are the thoroughness evident in the agency's consideration, the validity of the reasoning, the consistency of the agency's position over time. And of course, there's this sort of tacit assumed factor of, is this within the agency's uh, expertise and uh, something that they do a lot? Or is this the Office of Wages and Hours trying to make decisions about banking regulations or environmental pollution, which maybe they don't know a lot about? Now, the Skidmore factors, according to the Skidmore opinion, are non-exclusive. So it also says, or any other factors that may make the agency interpretation persuasive. Um, I want to help students connect this to the Hearst opinion. It seems like here, on uh, when you put these two cases together, on pure questions of law, the court decides the issue itself without any deference. So, for example, a question about whether the statute of limitations applies um, or, or any reference to the agency's view. On mixed questions of fact and law, where the agency has been entrusted by Congress with the power to issue some binding rulings and has done so with proper procedures, 
a court should give some respect or deference to the agency if its conclusion is reasonable and well articulated and so forth. And it looks like they've studied it. So that's going to be based on the record and why. Um, And on mixed questions where the agency can only issue non-binding interpretations, and that's the case in Skidmore, where this wasn't um, a promulgated regulation. It was something that didn't technically have the force of law, but announced what they would do when they sought injunctions, what to, how they were going to prioritize enforcement actions. The agency's views are entitled to special respect due to the agency's expertise and experience. But ultimately, we keep in mind, the court is still going, gets to decide what it thinks the right answer is, even though it will take the agency's view under advisement and may um, uh, give it some weight in its decision. Here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. Under Skidmore deference, which of the following is not one of the factors courts weigh in deciding whether to accept an agency's interpretation of a statute? A, the thoroughness evident in the agency's consideration. B, how emphatic the agency is that its position is correct. C, the consistency of the agency's position over time. And D, the validity of its reasoning. Hopefully that's an easy question. If you don't know the answer, you probably tuned out for a few minutes and should rewatch this video or rewatch the case. And that concludes our video about Skidmore versus Swift and Company, um, the old Supreme Court case that now um, it seems like in with Chevron gone after the Loper Bright case is sort of the rubric that courts will use when you have when the question in the case is the agency's interpretation of a statute that the agency has been authorized to implement by Congress.